I, I want to, uh, at least in the introduction, and if I don't run out of time in the conclusion, we'll see how that goes, uh, make reference to two kind of classic works of, of literature uh, to kind of introduce our, our theme uh, in what Paul is, uh, is getting at. There's, uh, and I could even preface, I don't know if you heard this comment by someone from uh, our State Department. I always feel bad for these young gals in the State Department doing these press conferences. But um, uh, in regards to, uh, to ISIS uh, a few weeks ago, uh, one of them said that, uh, uh, you know, the real problem is it's a jobs problem. You know, that's, that's the problem. You know, if they just had more jobs, we wouldn't be fighting this horrendous war uh, in, in the Middle East right now. And it's like, okay, where does that come from exactly? Well, it comes from this very progressive liberal mindset that says that man is basically good. And if you put man in the right environment, uh, then, then he will rise to the occasion. Uh, and so we need to do that certainly through, uh, through the environment, through, uh, through jobs, through education and so forth. If we can eliminate poverty, if we could educate our kids properly and so forth, then, then we're going to rise to this uh, utopia. Uh, and, uh, and that's kind of a prevailing thought uh, among, among a lot of people uh, out there in the world today. Uh, that is not the, the perspective of the Bible, of course. Mm -hmm. And one man wrote about that in that perspective named William Golding uh, in his novel, the, the Lord of the Flies. I don't know if you were forced to, or you had the opportunity to, to read that during, during high school. I do appreciate that my high school teachers always picked books that there were cliff notes for. But uh, uh, maybe you just read the cliff notes to Lord of the Rings or maybe saw the movie later. Uh, but it's a story of a plane load of British boys between the age of 6 and 12 there's a plane crash, and they're marooned uh, on a deserted island. Uh, they institute a British-style government, a civility, and order, and so forth, and everything goes uh, pretty well uh, for the, the first uh, couple of weeks on the island. But then a group of boys succeed from that, uh, uh, the, those that are uh, basically in charge, uh, and they, they go on wi a wild cycle of hunting, dancing, feasting, and then one night around the fire, a group of them murders uh, one of the other boys. Uh, and, uh, and basically mayhem breaks out after, after that. Uh, and uh, Golding, in writing uh, this particular novel, uh, said that uh, it reflected the defects of society, the defects of the human nature. And he goes on and, and says that at one time, uh, he held the other view that I just kind of espoused a moment ago. Uh, the man was perfectible, he says, quote, all you had to do was to remove certain inequalities and provide practical sociological solutions, and man would have a perfect paradise on earth. Uh, what changed Golding's view and caused him to write uh, The Lord of the Flies? World War II did, which he was, uh, was a part of and so forth. Uh, this is closer to the view that the Apostle Paul will, will take here uh, in these verses, chapter 4, verses 17 to 24. Again, we've been, we've been looking at uh, uh, so far uh, in chapter 4 as we turn to the practical, and again, our, our, our slides are here, the, the importance for unity uh, in, in the church. And, uh, you know, with our little slide, we won't go all the way back to chapter 1. But in chapter 4, uh, the importance for, for unity because of what Christ has done for us. Uh, and certainly we should have it uh, uh, within our own church, but even, even within the, the body of Christ. Uh, secondly, that next section was about unity with diversity. All the different gifts uh, in that uh, uh, God had not only gives each person a spiritual gift or gifts to use. And when they're all being used, we function together uh, in unity. Uh, and people are built up in their faith. And God gave gifted men, uh, again, apostles, apostles uh, prophets, uh, evangelists, and pastor teachers to oversee the church. Uh, that was our last time together. And one of those very important verses there is in verse 1 of that chapter uh, where Paul really gives us this particular word picture. If you'll look at that again, he says, I therefore, uh, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech, I beg you, to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Uh, and that word worthy, we said, is uh, axios or axiom. It's a Greek word. It means to balance. It's, he's talking about a balancing scale. He says that your walk, how you live, should be in complete balance with your calling. Sometimes we say your walk should uh, match your talk. Uh, but some people say, well, I don't really talk a lot <laughs> in terms of my faith, so I think I'm okay. Really, it's what you believe. 
Uh, and we went through uh, several things that talk about our calling that was uh, in Christ Jesus. But there needs to be this balance of what we're saying about our relationship with Jesus Christ. And it balances with how we walk and how we live our life. And this is one of the themes that Paul comes back to uh, here. Now, this is kind of the, the, the next slide for this little section. It's a before and after. And uh, I tried to get one of the tamer <laughs> pictures of uh, before and afters. And uh, even when I was um, uh, looking, looking at this, I, I, I came across a little, a little article and then saw a little video of how they can sometimes even uh, stage the before and after pictures. And they showed a guy and a gal <coughs> only a half hour apart, but dramatic before and after pictures simply by the, the lighting, uh, their makeup, <coughs> their posture, and so forth. Uh, they could make it look like they had... Uh, Taking some miracle cure, if you'll just take this supplement, you too can look like this in 30 days, you know, kind of a thing. Uh, before and after, there's some pretty dramatic before and after uh, pictures out there. And Paul is saying there should be a, a dramatic before we came to faith in Christ and after we came to uh, faith in Christ. Uh, and he's going to speak of that here. So he's going to say first in verse 17 and 19, we're to leave the old life. Uh, again, chapter 4 of Ephesians, verse 17, Paul writing, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness and greediness. Not exactly a compliment there. <clears throat> we'll kind of <clears throat> unpack this in some of these um, key phrases that, uh, that he uses here. <clears throat> but he's giving us a general view of, of what um, we were like and what the world is like uh, apart from G Jesus Christ. Uh, it is sinful and it is uh, self-centered. And uh, uh, if you're not, uh, not sure about that, all you had to do is uh, read the headlines this week. A German pilot flies his uh, plane into a mountain, killing everyone on board. Oh, he wanted to take his own life. This concept of mass killing is only, it's been popularized just in the last uh, 20 years. You know, we kind of hear these things all, all the time, don't we? Someone's going to do something. He wants to take his life, so he kills many people or his entire family, and then he takes his own life, whether it's in his home or in a school. Uh, these kind of people certainly match the description here for, uh, of the Apostle Paul. I read one headline, and I could probably just go on my phone and go to a news website and read some off to you, but uh, uh, this was on uh, just... Um, uh, yesterday on one website, uh, spring break parties would make Sodom and Gomorrah blush. And it was uh, talking about the kind of the lawlessness and sexuality involved with uh, spring break parties uh, across the country now in terms of uh, college students. Of course, a lot of the people that are attending them are not in college. <laughs> Paul basically uh, again says here that we should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. And that just simply means unbelievers. Again, the church here in Ephesus <laughs> certainly had some Jewish believers in it, but had a lot of uh, Gentiles. And he's saying that we should no longer live like we lived uh, before. Uh, and several things here. The first one is you're to leave a former way of thinking. Uh, notice uh, the emphasis on thinking. He uses the word mind in verse 17 and 23. He uses the word understanding in verse 18. He uses the word ignorance in verse 18, and he uses the phrase learned Christ in, in verse 20. When we come to faith in Christ, it's because we change our mind. We repent, and that's what repentance means, to change our mind. The Bible all along, God said all along that all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. Well, I don't like that. Uh, I don't think I'm such a bad person. I don't think I fit into that category. Well, you need to repent. <laughs> you need to change your mind and actually agree with God so that you could uh, see your own need uh, of God's forgiveness and salvation. That's how we come to the Lord. Uh, it's actually a change of our mind. It's a change of our thinking. Now, notice the contrast with the unbelieving mind. Verse 17, uh, towards the end, it's in the futility of their, of their mind. Uh, this means there's a, there's a lack of meaning and purpose to their lives. 
Now, unbelievers can have meaning and purpose to succeed in business, to get a great education, whatever it might. They might have goals and so forth, but in terms of true meaning and purpose to life is related to eternity and especially to God. Uh, it's impossible for them to have it. In fact, they live for, uh, for very self-centered kind of goals and purposes in contrast to us as believers, the pursuit of personal happiness. I, uh, I read one statistic that I thought was very uh, telling. Since 1900, the 100 wealthiest people in the world, of them, 50% took their own life. Uh, the idea that if you have enough money and enough success, you'll be happy, uh, there is no happiness in the pursuit of happiness. Uh, and certainly we, we see the, uh, the signs of that all, all around us. Uh, Luke 12, 15 says, For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. So despite the bumper sticker that says, uh, in the end, it's he who has the most toys that wins, uh, that's, not really, that's not really true. Uh, in fact, the opposite is quite, quite opposite of that, that seeking for pleasure and happiness will never bring pleasure, uh, will never bring meaning or purpose. They have a futile mind. Secondly, you're to leave a, a darkened understanding. That's in verse 18, having their understanding uh, darkened. This is the absence of spiritual understanding. Again, this is not the only times Paul writes on this subject. Uh, and just make a couple other references here. Uh, one would be in Romans 121, where Paul writes, uh, again, on the same subject, because uh, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were, that's our same word, were darkened. Uh, it's a suppression of the truth. Uh, it's, uh, they could know God. Uh, it's obvious by two things, we always say, uh, by creation and by conscience. Uh, everybody can look up and see creation, see the universe and so forth. Everybody's got a conscience, and by those two things, they can know that God exists, uh, but there's a suppression of the truth. Their foolish hearts become darkened. It goes from bad to worse. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writing in chapter 4, verse 3, uh, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, who's whose minds the God of this age, that Satan, had blinded who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. It's not bad enough what's going on in their own hearts and minds. Uh, it's what Satan does to them as well to blind them uh, from the truth of, of the gospel. Uh, and therefore, we've got, uh, we've got people like Shirley McLean and others in the New Age movement that will proud, proudly uh, stand before auditor auditoriums full of people and proclaim themselves over and over that I am God, I am God. Uh, everybody has the Christ consciousness in them uh, in the derivatives and the terms that come from that. Uh, not only is there a denial and a suppression of the truth uh, because they're futile uh, in their thinking, they're darkened, uh, they have no spiritual appetite for anything about God. Uh, and notice also then because of that uh, in verse 18, being alienated from the life of God. They have no Holy Spirit within them. Uh, they have no understanding of the description. Paul writes about that to the church in Corinth, uh, that the man without the Spirit cannot understand the things that come from the Spirit because they're foolishness uh, to him. Uh, there is no battle between the flesh and the Spirit. Uh, they don't have the new nature that we're going to talk about that we have just a moment. And they have no standard of morality. Well, they have a standard, but it changes all, uh, all the time. There's no standard that, uh, that is fixed uh, in place, uh, nor, nor is there uh, even a, a standard of truth that uh, they, they can rely upon. Uh, thirdly, uh, you're to leave. These are things that we've left behind. And as believers, <laughs> as believers we're to be leaving these things behind. We're not to be futile in our thinking. Our hearts are not to be darkened. Uh, the third one is, is a blinded or a deadened heart. That's in verse 18 again, because of the blindness of their heart. Now, NIV uh, it probably gets it a little better here, and it uses the word deadened, because that's actually the, where the Greek word comes from. Uh, again, the Greek word is uh, porosis, uh, and the word Poros, it means uh, a stone harder than marble. We might see, use the expression, a heart of stone. You're to leave behind what previously was a heart of stone. It's used of, uh, uh, of the Pharisees in, in regards to uh, how they viewed Jesus when Jesus went into the synagogue uh, there in Capernaum. Just uh, a beautiful, 
Beautiful setting right there on the uh, Sea of Galilee. One of the places that, uh, that we go to and we visit Israel. And uh, it's just exciting to be there and to think that this scene took place where uh, the enemies of Jesus are there. And they've noticed there's a man in the synagogue who has a withered hand. Uh, they are focused and believe that Jesus will go to that man because that's what he does. He goes to the person that needs him the most. He goes to the person that no one else will go to. And he goes directly over to the man, and he heals the man. And rather than rejoicing that this man uh, has been healed, that a miracle has taken place there in their synagogue, uh, they have a deadened heart. It's the same word that's, uh, that's used against them. They have a heart of stone. Uh, again, it's, it's not just an inability, but it's an unwillingness to respond to God's truth. Uh, again, back to Romans chapter 1, our same subject, this time in verse 18. Again, Paul writing, him, our, our same author, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And here's the, the point, who suppress, suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Uh, they just uh, can't admit uh, that God exists. I saw I saw a t-shirt, I think Doug posted it uh, on his uh, Facebook page uh, the other day, and it's, it was uh, two Christian guys, and, and the one t-shirt uh, said, uh, you know, it said atheist on it, and then it has the A in front of it, meaning, meaning opposite, uh, a atheist, and below, below it it said, I don't believe in atheist, but uh, that's the idea, the atheist, I don't believe in, in God. Uh, it's uh, very interesting that, uh, again, the, the new atheists that are selling books like crazy and on uh, the New York uh, best-selling Times list of uh, like Stephen Hawking's and others that are very aggressively uh, out there trying to persuade others that uh, God doesn't exist. Uh, brilliant men who are suppressing the truth. They actually know better. And some, sometimes in their writings and comments actually give give reference to the fact that uh, they're on very thin ice trying to describe where did mankind come from? How did life begin? They don't really have a, have a good explanation. And uh, it's always interesting to hear very brilliant guys uh, expels very kind of not so smart of ideas. And, what, and some of these, uh, the most brilliant guys in the, country, in the world now are saying that, well, life began because aliens must have brought it here. They, you know, there's no way it can just happen on their own. They're too smart for that. They understand the complexity of life. So aliens must have brought, that's the best you got? You know, no one of these guys don't well, do well in debates. I don't know if you've ever seen a debate with a guy presenting the theist view uh, and the atheistic view. Uh, as a Christian, you start praying for the atheist. That he'll just come up with something because he's, he's got nothing when you have to stick to, uh, to reason or philosophical arguments or, or even scientific arguments. It could be illustrated like this. It's like the little boy who's got a brand new puppy uh, and so he wants, even though he knows he's not supposed to, he wants it to sleep in his room. He smuggles the puppy up to his bedroom, uh, and then he hear, hears his parents coming up the stairs. He puts the puppy in the toy, his toy box and then sits on it. Uh, his parents come in the room and begin talking to him, and the whole time the puppy is scratching and whining and scratching and whining, but he just keeps sitting on that lid and ignoring it, uh, believing if he ignores it, then his parents won't realize the puppy's in the box. Uh, that's, that's the position uh, of a lot of unbelievers today. It's uh, a deliberate suppression uh, of the truth. And certainly uh, Paul is uh, concerned about it in his day. Uh, it's happening in our day. Uh, and all this realizes that, uh, well, how in the world did we get saved if this is what we left behind? By the grace of God and the intervention of God into our lives uh, and by the work of the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to the truth of the gospel, to give us a mind that can comprehend that spiritual things. But Paul is saying these are all things that we are to leave behind. This is the before, and there needs to be, there should be, the natural consequences of a life in Christ should be a, 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 a real distinct uh, contrast between the before uh, and, uh, and the after. He doesn't paint much of a picture here, but it helps us understand why uh, groups like ISIS and other jihadists can go around uh, beheading even small children, crucifying them through Syria and Iraq, uh, and, uh, and that terror is, uh, is spreading. Uh, it's, uh, it's a horrific world that we're living in. Isaiah the prophet said at one point in time, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for, uh, for bitter. 
Uh, darkness uh, of heart, a hardened heart, a heart like a stone. It's easy to say, well, I'm glad that, uh, uh, that we're no longer like that. But in reality, just as a point of application, even before we get to what we're supposed to be like, uh, it's, there's a, the writer of Hebrew warns believers that the same thing can happen to them. Uh, it's found in chapter 3 and verse 12 where he says, uh, beware brethren. So he's talking to believers. Uh, uh, Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Lest any of you, and there's our phrase, uh, be hardened. How does it happen? Through the deceitfulness of sin. Uh, it's not, a, it's not a, a natural occurrence. We've been delivered from it. But through the deceitfulness of sin, our hearts can be hardened again. For we've become partakers of Christ if we hold uh, the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Uh, while it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts uh, as in the rebellion. Uh, and again, this is making reference to the children of Israel. They're, uh, even as we uh, on, on, uh, in our Passover Seder talked about their deliverance, again, by the blood of the Lamb, uh, out of slavery, out of Egypt, you know, through the Red Sea, they experienced all the miracles. They saw all of the plagues. They saw the power of God. They get into the wilderness, what we call the wilderness wandering, and their hearts become hardened, and they no longer believe that God could provide for them, lead them, take them into the promised land. Their hearts become hardened, and of course, they, they die in, in that desert. Uh, only Joshua and Caleb are the only two that actually get to go in uh, of the, the, the million plus uh, people because of a hardness of heart. Uh, the word deceitful means trickery. Uh, stratagem is, uh, is another word. In other words, you don't realize it's happening. It's a sting operation. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not like, like uh, I get the feeling I'm being, you know, fooled here. No, you don't get the feeling. That's the problem. Uh, sin actually deceives you. You don't even realize it's going, going on. If we don't leave the old life, we become deceived by sins. Our hearts become hardened. We need to be reminded that the Israelites made a great exodus. Uh, we've made a great exodus out of sin, but because of their hardness of heart, they never fully in, fully entered into all that God had for them. And uh, the same can be true uh, of us as well. Uh, they uh, began to no longer believe. They began to no longer trust God. Sometimes we call this the garden syndrome, as in the Garden of Eden. Uh, again, what happened there? Uh, Adam and Eve began to mistrust the word of God and the character of God. Did God really say? Well, maybe he did. Maybe he didn't say it exactly like that. Maybe we misunderstood him. Uh, after all, you'll become like God yourselves. That's right. You know, why would God not allow us to have this ability? And so we fall into unbelief, the garden syndrome. There's a hardness of our own heart because we begin to question we begin to question the word of God. We begin to question uh, the character of God. But these are things that we're to have left behind. Fourthly, you're to leave a time when you lost all sensitivity. Uh, and again, there, there is no sensitivity. It does not exist. That's in verse 19. Who being, there it is, past feelings. Uh, that's our word for, uh, we use for calloused. Uh, having given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with, uh, with greediness. So they, they, they have lost a sense of morality. There's a hardness of heart uh, enslaves them. Their past feelings, there's a deadness. It breeds uh, a recklessness. Uh, and um, if you think that Paul was being too hard, I can tell you this. In the first century, uh, writers would absolutely agree with the Apostle Paul of his description of the world uh, that existed at the time of the writing uh, of this epistle. Uh, we're just a little more sophisticated now in the West, uh, and we've got different names uh, for things. People don't commit adultery. They have affairs. You know, we, we, just, we just spin the words and, uh, and act like it's not, not happening. Uh, and uh, one of the great concerns in terms of this uh, deadness, past feelings, there's a callousness. We don't, we don't feel like we should. Uh, and the problem is sensuality doesn't satisfy, but it creates a greater appetite for more. Uh, and you can ask about 70% of the young men in our country that go on a por por pornographic website at least once a month. 70%. I don't know how you, uh, in, in this particular survey, I'm not sure what young meant. I'm assuming, you know, 15 to 25-ish or something like that. 
uh, but uh, it doesn't satisfy. It creates a greater appetite. Uh, and, uh, and we now know, uh, because it's destroying marriages, uh, it's destroying uh, 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 families, uh, it's, it's a horrific uh, curse that's come upon uh, our own culture. Uh, one writer said that pornography is addictive, and neuroscientists are beginning to map the biological substrate of the addiction. Users tend to become desynthesized and to be bored with the type of pornography they use, seeking more pervasive forms of sexual imagery. It is addictive, and there's been a, a lot of studies done on this, because a, a chemical is released in the brain uh, that uh, feels great and so forth. It becomes addictive, like being addicted to cocaine or heroin or ice or anything else. Uh, it's a, a horrific problem. Uh, they become deadened. That's exactly what Paul is, is talking about here. Uh, verse 19, have given themselves over to lewdness. It means there's no, there's no restraint. There's no self-control. But these are things that we are to have left behind. Again, Paul describing uh, the life of the believer in terms of the fruit of the Spirit, that which should be naturally occurring in our lives as we uh, walk with Christ and seek to draw closer to Him. Uh, in Galatians 5.22, he says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, uh, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, uh, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Self-control. There is no self-control. Uh, before we came to faith uh, in Christ. I uh, came across this illustration. I thought it was interesting. I have a little image of one. That's uh, a praying mantis uh, appears to be praying uh, together, the male and the female together, uh, which leads to their mating. I don't know if you realize this then. Then the female bites the head off the male and swallows it up. Uh, so the author said, so be careful, guys. Don't lose your head over sensuality. <laughs> It's a, it's a huge problem, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, believers are supposed to be, have a clear before and after when it, when it comes to uh, these things. And it helps us understand why uh, and comprehend why, wow, we, we could have never saved ourselves how thankful we are for the grace of God. But as believers, we're not to adopt and adapt to the culture around us. Uh, and certainly this is, uh, uh, could be a picture of a gloomy pessimism, uh, but it's not because the hope comes in verses 20 to 21 or to leave an old life, uh, but we have learned a new life, and that's in verse 20. But you have not so learned Christ if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. It's a, it's a wonderful verse. Uh, and obviously, it's, it's all about how we learn. We learn in, in Jesus. Uh, first, you've learned the truth. Verse 20, uh, you have not so learned. Again, Jesus is the subject in the instruction, indicating the words to know Christ. Uh, the Ephesians here were, have been uh, learning Christ. doesn't mean they're learning about him or knowledge about him. Uh, they're learning him. Uh, his life, his ethics, his viewpoints. Uh, how he dealt with other people. They're, they're learning about him. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, we, uh, people say, well, I, I feel like I need to, to be discipled more. Okay, here you go. Uh, start with Matthew and uh, go to then uh, Mark and then go to Luke and go to John uh, and go through and begin to list all the times Jesus commands you to do something. You're going to find there's over 190. Just start working on those. You, you know, let Jesus disciple you. In other words, he's at, to be at the center of our uh, of our learning. Verse 21, if indeed you have heard him. And again, that if there in the Greek means if and it is so. It's just a figure of speech. So it's since, since you have heard him. Uh, Dr. F.F. F. Bruce says that uh, Christ himself is the Christian's teacher. Even if the teaching is given through the lips of his followers, to receive the teaching is in the truest sense to hear him. It's kind of interesting. It's kind of humbling. It's kind of scary <laughs> up here. What it's saying is that when we're together and we're really teaching uh, the Bible and teaching the Word of God, uh, then if we have open hearts, uh, the Holy Spirit is at work. Uh, we have the Holy Spirit within Him. We're within us. We're studying the Holy Bible, uh, and uh, and Jesus is the one doing doing the teaching. That. Uh, uh, comes as some relief to me, and you might differ about uh, how often that occurs, but uh, uh, that's why when I read the text, that's the most important part of the sermon. <laughs> what I have to say becomes secondary uh, after that. Uh, but it is an incredible thing. 
uh, that I think most Christians would agree, uh, there is a dynamic that takes place from the Word of God being taught, again, especially if we're doing it expositionally where we're saying we're allowing the text to speak to, uh, to uh, exactly what it says. Uh, we're not trying to get it to say something else. We're just allowing it to speak for ourselves. Uh, God, the Holy Spirit, uh, can cause us to really be being taught what Paul is saying of them uh, by Jesus himself. In John uh, 10, 16, Jesus talks about how his sheep hear his voice uh, and they follow me and I know them and I give them eternal life. And no one will ever snatch them out of my hand. It's a one, wonderful passage of Jesus being the good shepherd. He is the good teacher uh, as well. Uh, so therefore, we should, uh, uh, every time we open our Bibles, uh, be seeking to see Jesus uh, in them, what he would have to say. Again, uh, and it doesn't matter if you're in the Gospels or not. Uh, the whole book really is about him. Uh, to, again, to know more, certainly the Gospels is not a bad place to begin. So we need to leave the old life. There should be a clear uh, uh, before and after. Uh, the way we do that is we learn a new life, and there's some dynamic uh, instruction and change that comes uh, that's covered in verse 22 to 24. You must now live a new life, and there, it requires three things. Uh, verse 22, that you put off concerning your former conduct. The old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed, that's the other thing, in the spirit of your mind that you put on, that's the third thing, put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So the new life requires you to end the former life. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? And um, again, the image is putting off old clothes and putting on uh, new clothes. Uh, putting off the old man. That's not your father. That's uh, uh, it's just a figure of speech. It's uh, always used in a noun form, uh, often uh, translated the flesh uh, or the sin nature. It's all the same. Every reference to the old man or the flesh is a reference to a sin nature that he's just been describing uh, in the previous verses. An entire discussion on this uh, in the epistle to the church at Rome, chapters 5 to, uh, to 8. I just want to read through that very quickly right now. No, I, I don't, but uh, it would be helpful because it goes into some great... Uh, great uh, detail there. Uh, this idea of putting off certainly can be illustrated uh, just through the life of Lazarus uh, when Jesus comes to call him forth. He's, uh, you remember the story in John 11. He's, he's died. Jesus is delayed. His coming back. Uh, Martha and Mary are very, uh, you know, at least Martha is very upset uh, over that whole issue, knowing that if Jesus had come in time, uh, it could have healed Lazarus. Uh, uh, he's going to call Lazarus forth from the tomb. Uh, they're saying, man, it's been, it's been, you know, uh, four days. You know, it's, there's going to be a smell. The flesh begins to decay at that point. Uh, and, of course, uh, they move the stone at the request of Jesus. Uh, Lazarus uh, basically uh, has been resurrected uh, and, and comes uh, hopping basically out of the tomb. And Jesus has to give through the order in 1144, loose him and let him go. In other words, he had to take off the grave clothes if he was going to live the new life that Christ had given him. Uh, again, that's certainly not the main point of that passage. But it is an illustration of what Paul is uh, talking about here. His argument, you no longer belong to an old corruption of sin. You are a new creation in Christ, uh, so take off the grave clothes. Uh, the problem is I've worn them for a long time, and they're very comfortable. Uh, sometimes I don't even realize I've got the grave clothes on because it's just all so natural to me. Actually, I don't think I'm really lusting when I let my mind wandering but I am. I don't think I'm being prideful or resentful. It's just the way I am. I don't think I'm really gossiping. I'm just sharing a prayer request with a few people. Uh, but uh, the problem is I haven't ever taken off the grave clothes. Again, scripture and experience teach us that uh, the no one uh, is successful at doing this on a particular occasion. We'll all come forward now. We're going to pray for you. You'll shed the grave clothes. You'll put off the old men, put on the new. That's good until you hit the door and start down the hallway and you, you, uh, you bump into somebody and you can't figure out why that person is so rude anyway. So yeah, uh, the problem is this, will, this issue will always be with us until we're with Jesus. 
There's always going to be this battle. Uh, this isn't like a one-time deal you do. This is like a continued uh, process. But we have to at least recognize it's a process uh, and there's a battle that's going on. Uh, Paul says uh, and describes it in, uh, in uh, Galatians 5.16 uh, where he says, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's in nature, the old man. For the flesh lust against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, uh, you're not uh, under the law. Now, there's two kinds of believers uh, in, in regards to this issue. There are the believers that are struggling with this, this battle within. And then there's the liars. So you're, you're in one of the two categories. We're all, we all struggle with this. If you're not sure, ask your husband or your wife, and they'll, they'll explain it to you later. Uh, but it's a struggle, uh, and, uh, but yet we're to leave this old life behind. The new life requires you to end your former life, and, uh, and hopefully this next point will be helpful. The new life requires a new mind. So sandwich between putting off and putting on is verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit uh, of your mind. Uh, we really can't really put on the new, the new man, the new clothes, uh, if uh, our mind is uh, not altered and it's not renewed from what it was before. Uh, and I do that primarily by consistent time in the, in the Word of God. Uh, it's God's Word that washes my mind clean. It's God's Word. Uh, and I can tell you, I, I, you know, I grew up in the 60s, uh, and I, we were told to have an open mind. I you know, had an open mind for a good... 15 years or so, and I can tell you, it gets full of a lot of junk. <laughs> and so there needed to be a, a lot of washing that's going on. Someone said that physically you are what you eat, but spiritually you are what you think. So what do you think about? And, uh, and what are you putting in your mind? Proverbs 23, 7, as he thinketh in his heart, uh, so uh, is he. Now Paul again dresses the same issue of renewing the mind kind of in the classic Romans 2, 2, where he says, and do not be conformed uh, to this world. And when he says, and do not, it means stop it. I mean, the, it's going to be the natural occurrence for you to be conformed to like everybody else uh, around you. If you have noticed, we're kind of in the minority here. We don't get a lot of good press. Uh, we're not featured in, uh, in movies <clears throat> to be the great guys uh, and the helpful ones and so forth. But... Uh, <clears throat> We're not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove <clears throat> what is good and acceptable and perfect uh, in the will of God. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I could just uh, illustrate this, not that this would ever happen to me, but just for sake of illustration. <laughs> Somebody insults me uh, in, a, uh, in a terrible way. My reaction then is to punch them in the mouth. And uh, you would do that, Pastor Tim? Possibly. And uh, <laughs> I've come close, even as a pastor. <laughs> I, and, and that's a different story. Uh, we're, we're just, we're just going to stick to the illustration, not give a real life story here. Although, uh, you know, as funny as I say that, you know, all those episodes come, come flashing through my mind. I probably should have used one of those, but maybe not. <laughs> Save it for a men's retreat. <laughs> But, but what happens at that juncture when I want to punch this guy in the mouth is a flood of scriptures then come racing into my mind. You know, uh, bless those that, that persecute you. Be kind and compassionate to one another. You know, all those verses come rushing through my mind because my mind has been renewed uh, from, the word, from the word of God. And all of a sudden, I, I have to dial it back. And I have to just realize that I want to be, I can either at that point be controlled by the flesh, I can jump back into those old grave clothes pretty easily, or I can continue on in the new clothes that Christ has given me. Uh, it, it all happens between your ears. You know, as we, as we get to the spiritual warfare section uh, there at the end of this epistle, that'll be the same case. Most spiritual warfare happens right between your ears. It's right here. It's all about, uh, uh, about what you think. Uh, and we, and we, but again, the problem is if we're not renewing our mind through the word of God and those incidents come up and they happen, well, what happens if the word of God is not coming flooding into my mind? 
You know, it's, uh, you've got to put it in if it's, if it's going to come out on the right occasion. So important. There's just, there's just no shortcutting uh, to maturing in Christ apart from spending time with the Lord, spending time like this, studying God's word, uh, reading on your own. The third part of the equation, again, is the, uh, the new life requires putting on a new self. And that's in verse 24. And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness uh, and holiness. And the fact is, we have a new self. And um, uh, we don't have to live a, a self-centered uh, existence. Uh, and our task is, uh, uh, one writer said, is not to weave it, but to wear it. It's given to us. We don't have to figure it out. Uh, we don't have to create it. God gives us a new nature when we come to faith uh, in Christ. It's all through his grace. Uh, and again, but my, my part is in the middle. I need to put off and I need to put on. And in the middle is my renewing my mind. And that comes, pri again, primarily by spending time with the Lord, by spending time uh, in God's word. Again, it's his holy word working through his Holy Spirit to conform us uh, to the image of Jesus Christ. That's God's will. That's what God wants to do uh, in, in our lives. Uh, and his word makes all the difference uh, in the world. And I have time for my closing illustration. So the other classic piece of literature uh, that I wanted to mention is uh, another story of a, of a group of people that were uh, left on a deserted island. But uh, the, uh, the story begins uh, when the, ad the admiralty of Great Britain picked 33-year-old Lieutenant William Bly, who had just returned from the South Pacific sailing with Captain Cook on his last voyage uh, of, of discovery. Uh, Bly sails out on the bounty, and uh, of course, if you're familiar with the movie, the Cliff Notes, or the novel itself, uh, you re though this is a true story, uh, you realize that uh, it's mutiny on the bounty. So uh, they, uh, the idea is they were supposed to uh, uh, sail down into the West in Indies, uh, and then they were going to get saplings of breadfruit trees, uh, and then sail, sail them back uh, and, uh, and deliver them, go around the Cape Horn and so forth uh, and, uh, and get them uh, to the Caribbean where they're going to try to grow a crop of them there. Uh, two weeks, uh, they, they have some time in Tahiti uh, and the uh, captain allows the, the men to uh, go ashore and live ashore. Many of them take Tahitian girlfriends and wives, some of them marry and so forth. Uh, two weeks out of Tahiti, they become miserable, having left their wives behind and so forth. So first mate, Fletcher Christian, why is the guy's name Christian? Fletcher Christian, uh, basically commits the, the mutiny, as you know the story. Uh, the 44 men on board, 31 sided with Bly. The mutineers then uh, set off for Tahiti. They put Bly and the, and the other men uh, into uh, to boats, uh, and the mutineers set off for Tahiti to pick up their, their wives and a few other Tahitians some supplies, and they knew of a small little atoll island that was not on the British maps at the time. So the plan is to sail there uh, again and have their own little community, their own little uh, utopia. They would have everything that, uh, that they needed. Uh, Bly, in the meantime, navigates in the longboat 3,600 miles <clears throat> safely in 41 days using only a pocket watch and a sextant, and he arrives. He eventually then is able to report the crime, uh, which leads to, uh, to the discovery of these men. The mutineers settle on Picarin Island, uh, and, and basically what they, they did, uh, they, they, uh, they, burned, they burned the ship, uh, and, uh, and they weren't found for 25 years. Uh, when they were found, only one of the mutineers uh, was alive. All the others had killed each other uh, in the process, but the last one, Alexander Smith, uh, began uh, in desperation digging through some of the ship's supplies, uh, and he finds a Bible, and he begins to read the Bible. This is the true story. He begins to read the Bible. It changes him. Uh, he then has an impact on, uh, on others uh, around him. Uh, and today there's, there's a, a group of people that live there. They're all descendants uh, uh, of these men that live in a very moralistic so uh, society that only sees another ship every, every six months. Uh, what saved them was not the goodness inherent in man, because there's not any. What saved them was the word of God. 
uh, you know, if we're going to put off and put on, our minds have to be transformed. And that's, uh, there's no shortcut to it. It only comes through, uh, through spending time with the Lord uh, in, in his word. Amen.
All right. 